two general types of intercession. One is called the redemptive intercession, and then the supplicatory intercession. And I'll give you a couple of verses because there is no controversy at all about the redemptive one. Neither by blood of goats or in calves, but by, the, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained an eternal redemption for us. So he entered, carrying us, and now we have eternal redemption through his blood. That's a redemptive intercession. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but all the sins of the whole world. Okay? It's very clear. Propitiation means advocate, or attorney, or okay? kafar. And I love this verse because, in my opinion, it solves a lot of problems, especially if you speak to anyone who is non-Christian. And they talk, they ask you where in the Bible Christ is God and man in the same time, and why is that, and how is that. I find it's very simple and targeting right away. One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Okay? Now let us get to the. So there is no one who argue the unique role of our Lord or his blood in the redemption, as an advocate. However, there are many intercessors, especially in our church, and if you want to be uh, sort of an orthodox person, there is an order. We start with St. Mary, angels and archangels, John the Baptist, disciples, apostles, prophets, martyrs, saints, and then saints. Um, all of these intercessors have one thing in common, which is that they all pleased God, they all had an acceptable uh, life, and third, they, they are all present in his kingdom, and his voices are heard. So intercession of the saint is merely a prayer of supplication. They cannot change uh, your position, they are not uh, have a shafa'a kafariya. They cannot redeem you. They can intercede on your behalf. They can explain. They can stand before the throne of God praying. And that's what I want to ask. Because that's really, a lot of people have problem. That does not make sense. If God loves his children very much, that's how I'm going to answer this question. He does not need others to pray on his behalf, on their behalf. You know? Like my own son can come and talk to me. Why would I ask Mina to intercede on my son's behalf? So that's what they say. So what does the Bible say and what does the logic claim? So I'm going to answer in two sections. The very direct verse, by the way, which I'll take the logic from it, came from uh, Thessalonians and Ephesians. Pray for us. St. Paul is asking the Thessalonians, pray for us. And St. Paul in Ephesians says, praying always with all prayer and supplication for all the saints and for me. And remember, St. Paul is considered the patriarch at that time. So the patriarch is asking the people to pray for the saints. The saints are the other servants and the poor. And pray for him as well. And the reason is that I will be given to you. Let's talk about logic. So if we ask others to pray for us who are still striving in this life, subject to passions like all of us, shouldn't we rather ask the prayer of those who we are sure in heaven? Yani, if St. Paul would say to Titus, please pray for me, and he's still on earth, 
it, it goes through the same problems. He could even fall and who knows if he can go to heaven or not. Why it is so difficult to think of those who departed and we are sure they are in heaven? Logic says yes. Have they lost their favor because they died? I mean, think about it. I can ask Nina, please pray for me. And he asked, Hani, please pray for me. If I die, and hopefully I go to heaven, he cannot ask for my prayer? If I was able to pray for him on earth, did, I, did a person lose his favor in the eyes of God because he died? Another logic. Or is it only lawful to ask for their prayers here on earth, but not when they are so close to Christ? Like, if I ask Mark to pray for me, and he gets busy and he forgets. But one time, he became so lonely. He didn't have anything to do, except to remember every single one who prayed for him. Think back of another person, hundred falls over this loneliness. He is now so close to Christ, and Christ asked him, um, provide me with all the people who asked him to pray for me. So if we request men, guys, we have a lot of chairs here. Rani. And if we request men to pray for us, shouldn't we rather ask the angels to pray for us? It's another logic, right? I mean, we are asking each other, Kamal, please pray for me. I can ask Kamal to pray for me. I cannot ask Archangel Michael. I know him and Archangel are like, you know, that type of thing. Ah, <laughs> so, uh, shouldn't we ask the angels? I mean, if we are asking each other. Okay. God often, and this is what take the main bulk of the time. Let us talk biblical now. Where is intercession in the Bible? And I'm going to talk about three things. From the Old Testament, and then for people who departed, and then New Testament. The most famous is the story of Abraham, and he's a patriarch. When he met King Abimelech, and basically he lied about his wife. You know, Sarah was a beautiful woman. Abimelech wants to take her as his wife. He took her, actually, literally to the palace, and that night had a dream. God told them, watch it. Don't touch this woman. Um, sorry. I'm sorry, there is a, there is a line that I can't... And God told them, now the Lord came to Abimelech in a dream, warned him that he would surely die. And the Lord said to him, Abraham is a prophet. He shall pray for you, and you shall live. Did you see this, what's happening? God appeared to Abimelech. And rather than tell him, listen, I am forgiving you for you trying to take Sarah, uh, Abraham. And it wasn't his fault. He said, go I find somebody, sometimes God is so funny. I mean, he's in front of you. Forgive him. No. Go to Abraham, and he will pray for you, and then I forgive you. Intercession. The second story. Job. The story of Job, the righteous, and his three friends. Maybe not quite friends, by the way. Uh, in a similar manner, in our Fintama, Job was, was, there is plenty of cheers. We need an usher, man. I really need to stop this uh, thing. I don't know what's going on. You can give me a blessing. So, what happened is, Job was, as you know, he was quite uh, afflicted, let's call it, afflicted. And a lot of people was philosophizing, philosophizing his sickness. Maybe you are sick because you didn't believe in God, maybe you didn't do all the, the good things, maybe you, you were full of yourself, and so on. After, and it took 38 chapters for people to make fun of Job, let's call it. And from 30, 
three and uh, 38 forwards. The last one spoke and then God spoke the last three chapters. So something like that. Like the Bible records that the Lord said to Eliphaz, the, the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends. Therefore, God speaking to the three friends, take unto you seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up yourselves a burnt offering and look at this look how much you feel like God is so uh, has uh, has passion towards his friends you know when you have a good friend and tell him he's my friend go to Job my servant and Job shall pray for you and for him I will accept lest I deal with you after your fall. Again, God is in front of the guys. He could have told them, I am forgiving you. He said, go to my friend Job and ask him and give offerings. And when he prays for me, I will forgive you. Intercession. A third story. And this is probably the most important. I said the first one was most famous, but this is the most important. Also Abraham, and you know the story. God decided to burn Sodom and Gomorrah. And for reasons untold to us, except amazing bond between God and Abraham, we will never understand until we go to heaven. Even if anyone tries to explain it, I still feel very short of thinking, how can extensive bond between God and Abraham to make God compelled, obliged how can I not tell Abraham who is Abraham but anyway if God felt obliged I must tell a secret so he said and the Lord said shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do and the Lord discussed the matter with Abraham and gave him a chance to intercede. And you know the story. And the story began basically a bargaining type of story. If there is 50, are you going to burn the kalam of It's not really you. And say, so, okay, if there is 50. So how about 40? How about 30? How about 20? How about 10? And he stopped. He felt shy to ask for one. And of course, this not only demonstrates that, that favor between God and Abraham, but also the idea that the presence of ten could have saved the town. Yani, leave, leave Abraham. Abraham is very clear. He's interceding. No question asked. Nobody would argue that Abraham is interceding. But think about that God was willing to save a whole town because of ten Pray for the rest. That's by itself is very important meaning. Because sometimes we say, it doesn't matter if we pray for the church or the pray for the last or pray for the meeting or pray for No. He told hey. Jeremiah for one. For one person telling the truth, I will forgive the whole Jerusalem. So, but also for the favor all the righteous have with God, seeing that God would have spared the whole city for the sake of ten. By the way, there was only how many? Huh? There was Lot, Lot, his wife, and the three. Five, right? And then we lost his wife in the way. And the Lord said, if, if I find fifty righteous, and I told you the story. I will not destroy it for the 20th sake. I will not destroy it for the 10th sake. Just think of this word. Because sometimes I feel we are responsible. I will not destroy New York for the 10th sake. I will not destroy Queen's Church for the 10th sake. I will not destroy the meeting of the youth because of the 10th sake. Makes you responsible. Okay. Okay. This is very interesting. For David, my servant's sake. By the way, the one who I'm not like putting a title that I made up. This title is made up by God. For David, my servant's sake. 
I want you to, I mean, th those are three verses. I'm going to read them, but before I read them, notice that they are all in the same chapter, first King 11. So let's go back one by one. So God is talking to Solomon. David is dead. David died. Notwithstanding in the days I will not do it for David your father's sake. I will rend it out of the hand of your son. But you wish Karasa Gamafi Karasi Hana Sars. Plenty of cheers. So to Solomon, he is not he is going to wait because of David's sake. To Jeroboam, who is the grandson of David, Behold, I will rent the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, but he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake. And then a third one, again to Jeroboam, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all days for the day. What is going on? It's amazing that God is a public figure. It's very interesting actually. I didn't think about it. Why people get tears in the car? It's comfort zone. No, it's very interesting. It's a phenomenon. Um, so if you think about it, three times in the same chapter, and God is saying, for your servant's sake, this is by the way in the Psalms. I actually didn't have time to look who wrote this psalm. Anyone can find out. But I know this psalm, but I didn't know who wrote it. I don't think it's David, by the way. But it may be one of the other ones. You know, the psalms are not only written by David. Maybe but this psalm, it's written on, for your servant David's sake, turn not away. Like, I am calling God now, not, not David, not Solomon that on behalf of David, accept me, or do not turn your face against me. So this is, I think, now I am done with the Old Testament. If such is the favor that David has with God, how much more would be the favor of the Virgin, the angels, the favor of the Baptist, and so on. Let's go on. Let's get to the New Testament. Jesus heard the intercession of the people when the centurion asked. You know the story, right? That there was a non-Jew, by the way. The centurion means a Roman guy. Okay? And amazingly, there was double intercession in this story. Does anyone remember it? There was double intercession. The centurion interceded on behalf of his servant, and the people interceded on behalf of the centurion. Who are the people? The Jews. Jesus was walking. He was going, by the way, in his way. And all of a sudden, a centurion came and said, Please heal. My servant is sick. And I love him very much. So the people told him, By the way, can you heal his son? This centurion built our synagogue. Built our temple. And, and it's double intercession. The centurion asked for... Sorry, uh, for, of the healing of his servant and the whole flock, the people around him, testify to him how good is this Gentile was to them. The centurion was good to the Jews. So the Jews interceded on behalf of the centurion and the centurion interceded on behalf of his slave. And by the way, he wasn't his son. Then, sorry for the spelling mistakes. Then the man, the man showed Jesus even a greater thing by asking Jesus not to enter under his roof. You know the story, of course. I'm not here to give you stories, but the idea is there was double intercession. Saint Mary and the first ever recorded miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ when she and uh, some of the disciples, not all of them were recruited yet. This is, by the way, John, John 2. So... Not all the disciples, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Not the disciples were, were recruited right. yet. And all of a sudden, she goes to the wedding of Cana. And here we go. And 
all of a sudden there was a major embarrassment because in the middle of the ceremony, the wine, which is the customary thing to be offered, finished. And, not, and Kenya, if you look at the map, is a very tiny little village, nothing close. And anyway, very, very embarrassing. And here comes St. Mary. And we don't even know that Jesus do Marcos, does Marcos. And she goes and says, they don't have wine. And most people review this miracle and say, this is probably the shortest ever recorded intercession or, or prayer. That she proposed to him the problem without offering a solution, saying, Lord, I don't have one. And she sat down and she was very sure that he will do it. And he turns around, although he told her, this is not my hour, because by the way, the word hour, if you follow it in John, means the hour of the cross. He told her, my hour is not here yet. But she doesn't even listen. I mean, she sent Mary's to email. And she says the prayer and she's sure that he will listen. She goes and sits down and he goes and turns to the other side to the service and tells them, go and fill the pots of water. There are 20 uh, uh, liters, 20 gallons of, of water size and they filled them all with water and there was more wine to cover the three villages around them. All of this St. Mary interceded. Um, if, uh, if you take the, the church history <clears throat> and I enumerated a few things. So I gave you Old Testament, New Testament, where in the Old Testament and New Testament where is intercession? And then history, this is not in the Bible, so you can argue that they may not be true, but they are all reported in many places as history. But again, I'm not putting them at number one or two. So, we say Al-Adra Halat al-Hadid, whoever doesn't know the story, uh, it's after um, the Lord ascended after the Pentecost, which is happening on Sunday, what happened is, um, Mat Matthias got arrested and he was in jail and a lot of prayers went off and Mary was still in Jerusalem and she was sort of transported, let's call it because we don't know how she went from Jerusalem to the town that he was in and she walked in and she knew he is in jail she prayed to our Lord and the whole steel and the whole town melted so no knives, no bars, no shields. And when that, of course, Matthias uh, came out of jail and she took him, transported him the same way to Jerusalem. And when the ruler of the town asked what happened, they said there was a strange woman that came today and there's some link. So that was some more. Okay, the moving of the Mukatta mountain east of Cairo. Uh, during the Fatima's uh, times. Of course, again, this is history, but this is well re recorded, by the way. Uh, because even in the, in whoever reads in the Fatima's time, there were a major earthquake, and they say that the mountain was moved. But of course, they don't report that there was any. Well, we have chairs here. We have two chairs here. Um, so, Mukattam uh, story, if you don't know it, it's very dear to us because it has so many lessons. But basically, there was a competition between the Jews and, and Christians in front of the Muslim ruler. And the Muslim ruler would sit like this, and the Jews here, and the Christian here, and everybody would make fun of the other. So, the Christian bishop made fun of the Jewish rabbi saying, um, it's written in their Bible, or their Torah, that even the ox knows more than them, and even the donkey knows how to go home, and they don't know how, who is their God. So that, the... It's not very nice. Huh? 
That's yeah. not very nice of him. He's not. He, he was. He was uh, <laughs> no, what happened is the Jew started first, and then yeah, you, you, may, you may have you may say that he instigated the whole thing, but anyway, so the guy became so annoyed, so angry, and he gathered all the Jewish rabbis looking for a mistake in the Bible. So they couldn't find a mistake, but they found the verse that they say, "We got it. We got it." There is a verse that says, "If they have." even as tiny faith as a mustard seed, we could move this mountain from here to here. So they came the next day and said, this is it. We want it to happen. And the bishop, Ibn Zara, uh, at that time, requested three days fasting from the whole town, from the whole Egypt. And while he was praying on the third day, St. Mary appeared to him, again in intercession. And basically told them, go outside, collect the first man you meet him, don't let him run because he will run. And he really tried to run. And he was basically the guy who sells water, or takes a Arabic money out. Kabbalah or shoemaker. 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 shoemaker or a Kabbalah. No. 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 He was a, uh, he's not a shoemaker. The shoemaker is San Mark's story. And he knows it is cafe. This is, was a water guy carrying the water. He goes Some writing is the road that he is. Really? Okay. Uh, that's what I know, but please verify what you guys think. Um, anyway, the story goes, off, goes on that basically he requested everybody to say Kirya and while they are saying Kirya every time it will move. And while it's moving, people got so scared and uh, as the Dean Lal Fatemi, who was in charge of Egypt at that time, got so scared, said, okay, 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 just leave it. I know where you want it to be placed. And basically, they put it in a, that's where I'm not sure of, in a different place where a lot of wind was coming, filling Egypt with the dust. Now it's in a little place. I don't think this is true because there's a lot of dust in Cyprus <laughs> too. <laughs> so I'm not sure. Maybe they should have put it in the water, but. Um, that's not our... But anyway, the third, of course, the apparition of our, uh, our mother, St. Mary, in more than one time, 68 in Zaytun and 1986 in Shubra, and with a lot of intercessions and a lot of miracles that well documented, by the way. Uh, by the way, as a, as a physician or a scientist, I don't take miracles easy, by the way. Maybe it's my own lack of innocence but, so I only take the miracles that are very well documented, and there are well documented um, miracles, whether from Abu Sufyan or, or on Manur, and we, where you see an x-ray before right. and after, and things like that. Well, we shouldn't be but, naive. Yeah, so those are the ones I'm talking about, and those are the ones. Okay, so the last hey, question. Hello, hey, this is, uh, can be interesting, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, from Google. It says Coptic icon of Saint Simon the Shoemaker, depicted as one eyed man carrying a sack of water. I see the shoemaker. He used right? to carry water to the sick and the old every morning before going to work. So, so can he be like both? It looks like. Yes. Yes. Google doesn't want anyone to be upset. Yes. That's, yeah. Google. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 Yes. But the service was... Uh, I see. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good yeah. point. He made me my shoe. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. And whoever goes to Egypt, you should try to visit um, the Mukattam um, church because it's really built in the rock. And it's an amazing, maybe a couple of thousand people size. So it's a huge thing, but it's built inside almost the rock. Um, the next, um, maybe the one before the last question is, do angels and saints know our affairs on earth? What is the answer to that question? Do they know what happened on earth? Yeah. No. Yes. no. Yes. 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 Yes, they, they know partially, not fully. Because the Bible says that we are surrounded by them in the book of uh, Hebrew. We are, they are living. Because God is a God of living, not of dead. So they pass to the other uh, 
place which is more holy, with a better place, better position, better understanding. So for those who said, no, tell me why now, since we heard the yes. Unless you want to counter the mm -hmm. act, the yes. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure about angels, but uh, let's say saints are humans. Yeah. So whoever dies after, uh, after death, is he allowed to see on earth? Or is, he, uh, is he in the body? Yeah, he's not in the body. No. I mean, I mean, you are saying because he's human, he should not know what's happening on Earth, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if he's, he's there, there he's, he's, not there. he's not human. I'm talking about saints. Yeah, yeah. saints, but yes. Uh, he's right. what, what I think Dr. Samir is asking you, he is sort of counteracting your right. point. Y your point is because he's human, he cannot see, but he, you are talking about, say, Saint Mina. He was human, but now he's a soul. Yeah. Can he know now? Okay, okay. My point is, there are people who went to heaven, others went to hell. Yes. Are the are guys in heaven have a privilege that the guys in heaven okay. doesn't? Oh, of course. course. Okay, just, just tell me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is nothing wrong. I mean, everybody should see this. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, well, we believe that if you know, we live a saintly or heavenly life here, we'll have a special place with God. So, those are the people that are closer to God. So when, they, when we pray for their intercession, they're the ones, to put it in a human term, they're kind of the ones next to him. So they're the ones that can tell him. I guess that's the way I look at it. So if, if we look at it, like if, if like Jesus is a person and they're all next to him, that's, that's kind of the idea, but on a more non-human level. No, I was going to say in the, in the story of Lazarus, the poor the beggar, doesn't uh, Abraham talk about the virgin? That's an excellent, uh, excellent example. Maybe, yes, I have another story about uh, Sarah, uh, Zanjara of Ayala. He accompanied to be on the journey and he know all his need and he go with him as a... Tobit, to right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, so... Very good. So I'll tell you... The answer is definitely yes for these reasons. Yes. So for those who said yes and didn't know why, for those who said no, please remember because I can tell you, not that this bunch of people have a lot of doubt about intercession, but you will meet a lot of people make you not able to answer. And I, my, my duty is to help you answer so you don't doubt what you believe in. I know you believe, but the problem is we are... We are asked not just to believe, but to respond in wisdom and truth to others. So, let's see. Any emphatic? Emphatic, yani, without doubt. Emphasize the verb. The knowledge of those in heaven is far more than those of earth. In First Corinthians, First Colossians, for now we see through a glass, darkly, <coughs> but then face to face. Now I know in part. But then shall I know even as also I am known. Wow. I will be known as he knows me. Meaning, when we go there, we have full knowledge. Of course, the verse means full knowledge of God more. But a lot of people think that this is also some knowledge of the people you love. Like, for example, I'm worried about Mina if he arrived home or not. I'm his uncle. So I keep calling him. Do you think when I'm there, I completely ignore inshallah man or Allah, well, uh, there will be some sort of right. attention to his needs because he's praying to God. So let's see about this. The first of those <coughs> on earth, yeah, um, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repents. I think you can take that as an indirect evidence. If the angels are joyful when I repent, that means they know that I repent. Right. So that's also an evidence, call it in there. And the saints become like angels, as the Bible said. Yes. So they have the same sharing feeling. Okay, in Revelation 5, angels know our prayers because they carry the prayers to the throne of God. Um, you know, this is a very nice chapter, not just the verse. Having every one of them... Um, 
I think this is the 24 elders, not the angels, so I'm sorry. The 24 priests, golden bowls uh, uh, full of incense, which are the prayers, no, it is the same, it is the angels, uh, carrying um, uh, 24, uh, how you call it, bowls or bowls? Bowls. Bowls of incense, which are prayers of the saints. And let hear salawat of the saints. This is the story that uh, Mina said. And if you don't know it, you should be aware of it. Because as I said, we are in a time we used not to meet Protestant a lot. Now we meet a lot of people who try to make you doubt your own orthodoxy. And this is one of our pillars. And this is a story very easy to find and very easy to explain and good evidence for intercession. So the story, as you know, there was a rich man and there is a poor man. Both died. Let me make it very easy. Very fast, I mean. Both went to somewhere. One went to paradise, the other went to Hades. And watch for the accuracy of the words. Paradise and Hades, not heaven and hell. And the, the dialogue that happens, call it symbolic, but God meant from it some evidences. The dialogue, basically, the one who was in paradise was in the bosom of Abraham. He starts listening to the guy in Hades. And the guy in Hades is the rich man, said, send Lazarus to wet my tongue. So Abraham told him there is a big space between us. Yeah. So he said, okay, why don't you send them to my brothers in earth so they can believe? So Abraham told them, and watch for this, because Mina rightly said most of the story, but the second part is even better. Mm -hmm. Abraham told them they have Moses and the prophets. And Moses, by the way, came 400 years after Abraham. Yeah. How would they know? Look at this. How could Abraham know about Moses and the prophets knowing that he departed hundreds of years before the birth of Moses? So there are double evidence here. Number one, that he knows that uh, his, his brothers are in earth suffering. Mm -hmm. And Abraham knows that Moses came after him. That means they are aware of Again, when I say aware, it's only awareness through God's allowance. Like, they don't have to know what's the stock market. I mean, you have to understand, I mean, those people are concerned about the salvation of God's sons. Yeah. That's the only thing. So, if Pope Shunuda lives here, he doesn't really care with all respect. Who will take the bishop place of this? That's not the important thing. But he will be minded with the people who was praying for them on earth. He would love to continue praying for them on heaven. And now without sickness, without needing to sleep, without going to the doctors, without getting chemotherapy, it's a lot easier and faster. Uh, can, can I ask you something? Because I have a lot of friends uh, from the brothers and, and you know. They always say, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I always tell you, all right, anyway, they always say this, if you are in the presence of God, okay, you are overwhelmed yes. by God, you are absorbed, yes. your attention is arrested by God, automatically, so you don't have more space to look for, I know there is unity of the kingdom of light of Jesus Christ. So they care about us. We are one church, okay? We are one body of I, I Christ. Understand. I understand. But I think that the, the point I'm trying to make, they are not curious creatures. It's not out of curiosity Saint Nina knows, wants to know your, uh, whatever is happening to you. But when you ask for prayer, please God, in the intercession of Saint Nina, I need a baby. I am a wife and I have been wife for many years and I don't have a baby. Mm -hmm. He knows that you are bad. I am bad. I don't have a baby. And he intercedes about that. You see my point? But it's not curiosity. They want to know because he is absolutely right. 
the, the amount of, of knowledge that they need to grasp in the presence of God far supersedes any other thing. But God, because he honors his servants, and it's coming now, he would tell Paul Kronos, go down to this woman, she needs a baby. I mean, he could have given her a baby. But why would Pope Kronos appear to a woman and tell her, you will have me now? And it happened so many times. And these are, again, I'm talking only about documented, medical documented miracles, not the ones that I feel uncomfortable reporting. But uh, something was medically not going to happen, and then there is a, a clear something happened that nobody has seen except this woman, and then a medical clear uh, sort of resolution of the first thing. Like a, like a, a tumor and now it's not there and it was there. Something like that. Why would God make Pope Carolus or Marimina or whoever appear? I mean, he wants to honor Pope Carolus. Right. At that time, Pope Carolus is aware this woman needs a baby. You see my point? Yeah. But it's not Pope Carolus added our mean man dushayel. And he doesn't, he is more interested, as he said, he's becoming a being of praise now. He's becoming a being of praise. He's joining all the choirs of angels and archangels praising all the time. But because he's human and because he's connected through the prayers, through the one body, body yeah. of Christ, he would accept his prayers presented before the throne of God. Yeah, makes sense. Now, do righteous people in heaven know of the affliction of those on earth? And that's, I think, the question that Danny answered. I like this verse in Revelation 6 because I feel it's, uh, it has a lot of benefits, by the way. But one of its benefits, it solves this question. Revelation 6 is one of the, it was the fifth seal when it's open. Every seal open, something happened. It's not the, the today's. So when the fifth seal is open, a lot of people under the altar, yeah. John saw a lot of souls, un souls, 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 under the altar, and they start uh, screaming, praying to God. But look at the prayer. Again, those are souls of people who were killed, like say the 21 martyrs of Libya. Like, for example, all the people who were killed by the Diocletian or Arianus or, I mean, yeah, anyone. Those were a lot of souls under the altar. How long, O oh Lord, they are going to God. How long, O oh Lord, holy and true, you do not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on earth? It's a question. They are raising a question. Until when you are going to let the people who are on earth to be happy and they keep killing our brothers? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until, look at this next one, until the us, us, until their fellow servants also and their brothers that should be killed as they were should be completed. So the people under the altar are martyrs. They still praying for those like us on earth. Right. They feel our afflictions. They are aware of our uh, troubles. I think that's, to me at least, is a good evidence that the people, although they are in paradise, they are still concerned about the well-being and the salvation of their brothers who did not yet complete their uh, salvation. And this is the verse that Sas Kamel just mentioned. Is God is the God of the dead. You know? Because he says in Matthew, and maybe in another gospel as well, I think it's written in more than one gospel, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but not of the living. By the way, each one of those is about 2,000 to 3,000 years before this verse is written. Historically speaking, around that time. Because Adam is about 5,000, I mean yeah. 2,000, 3,000. 
This verse was literally, historically, should be wrong. What are you talking about? 2,000 years later, Abraham is not just dead. There is not even bones. No, but a, the God is naming himself not the God of... No, I'm the God of people who, in your opinion, dead. But there is no way you can be dead, because how can I be the God of the dead? I am author of life. But I am the author of life that all what I am calling my name after them, I am God of Daniel, I am God of Abraham, I am God of Job, I am God of De any one of them. Those saints are living, so why do we consider them dead by not asking for prayers? I mean, if God himself, God himself, call himself the God of somebody that I think is dead, why are you interceding on asking Abraham? Abraham, I'm mad. He's a kind of Ben God himself is calling himself after Abraham. How dare me, little man, to say I'm not right, right. using people because they are dead. But God is telling you they are not dead. Exactly okay? right. But both Moses, oh, this is another evidence. You know, in the transfiguration, one of those two men dead, Moses, to the, Moses, by the way, the only man that died and buried by God himself. By the way, okay? This is amazing. If you read it, it's very, it's mind-boggling. You're like, he took him to the mountain and he buried him himself. God himself. Okay, so Moses is dead. Elijah did not die. But both of them appeared with Christ yes. in the Mount of Tabor, in Transfiguration Mount. I'm done, five minutes. Um, so if you think about it, these are about 14 centuries earlier than Christ, but they are appearing with him. One dead, one not, but both of them connected through the God of the living. So finally, another may say that we should not pray to the saints, but only to God. I'm, I'm almost answering the logic questions that comes to everybody's mind. But, but you are right. We should not pray for the saints. Absolutely. Only Jesus. God, through the prayers of Saint Mary, he can say, but the whole issue at the end, that God is so generous. So he can make one of us appear to give something and he is completely empty-handed. God can make Pope Corollus to heal not because he has power within him. He has the power within him is from the Holy Spirit that we have on Sunday. Yes. That's, that's a, a spirit, I mean a function of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But because he's a holy man, the Holy Spirit function was appearing so clear within him. But, uh, through him, and all of a sudden, Pope Carolus is No. Taman, forget. Sometimes we are so simple minded. Like this group is not the most simple minded. You guys are all educated, at least a couple of university levels and bachelor, maybe more and more. Harvard. But at the same time, if you go and talk to people who are so simple, not even two years of education, I want you to understand the right thing, but I want you to understand the simple mindness when you go to Egypt and Upper Egypt and they believe so much. Archangel Michael cured me. It's okay, we understand. Her faith in God is without doubt and much more than all of us. Yeah. But that's the way she simply, her mind works. So, of course, for in asking for their help, we are not praying to the saints, but actually asking them to pray on our behalf. And that's the correct way of praying. So in summary, we ask for the saints' intercession because of the great favor they have for God, with God. We ask for their intercession because God allowed and accepted intercessions in the Bible. We believe in intercession because we believe in the life of the world to come, because we believe that the saints who departed are still alive. 
We ask for the intercession of saints to honor them, to God, for God Himself to honor them by accepting them, to, uh, saying, "If a man serve me, he will, he and I, the Father, will honor him as well." We believe in intercession because we believe in the unity of the body of Christ. We are all members. I think a man mentioned this: one body, whether we are here or there. Some, I think Abu Nafshoi Kamel one time said. We don't like to say uh, a um, struggling church and, and a victorious church. No, we are all victorious church. But one, the head of the church is up there and the legs are still here. But we are one victorious church. It's not like No, we are one church. Because we, use, we are all used to victorious and struggling. But he is trying to give us the hint. No, we are all one. But it's like a giant big church, half of it in earth, and the other half is growing to go there. Yes. By believing intercession, we practice humility, by the way. And this is the final point. Because if I refuse to ask you to pray for me, I am almost saying I don't need you and I don't need the body of Christ. Oh. And by that, <laughs> uh, that, that is scary. For me, it's scary to feel arrogant. It, it, it destroys all the spiritual life. So I have, I finished, but and I'm going to step on something. This is the last. I finished, but I'm worried about this part. And please pray for me that I don't offend anyone, because especially in New York, some priests teach something that's not quite right. And please accept what I'm saying with a lot of humility, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but I want you to grow knowing the right teaching. Why do we pray for the departed? Why? Pray the, the prayer for the departed. Why? We do not, we cannot, we will not move anyone from Hades to Paradise. Period. This prayer means nothing compared uh, moving from one person to another. The only little benefit of this prayer is to feel connected with one church. That those who left us, we still pray for them. And as we pray for them, we hope that they pray for us. Period. Please, if you think that your prayer can move somebody from Hades to Paradise, think of those who do not have friends. But that will be unfair. Exactly. Right. Like, like imagine, I die today and you guys love me, so you pray for me, God move me from heaven. Okay, I die today, but I don't have any friends. Nobody pray for me. I stay in Hades, and you think God is fair? So the prayer of the departed is merely to show two things. One, we are one church. We pray for each other. Second, that one day I'm going to be prayed for as I'm praying today for my father and my grandfather. For me? And today I remember the people who I love and departed. Tomorrow you will remember me when I love because when I leave because you love me. And to the day after, when you leave, your sons will remember, and so on, so they are connected. But your prayer is actually for you more than for them. It's for us, not for them. And please, if you got a different teaching that's not compatible with the church teaching, and I say it with a lot of humility, and I don't mean offending anyone, and I'm not talking about any particular idea, I'm teaching orthodoxy. And that's biblical. And there's a lot of biblical proofs of, for all of this. It could have been Lazarus, when I mean the guy praying and saying, Let Lazarus, and you all look, Abraham, why don't you pray for me so I can come and spend time with Lazarus? And you know, we have a big space. Nobody can cross from here to here. Finish. Finish. So please, when you are in the Mass, in the liturgy, and you remember your faith, do I know whom you want to remember? Remember them so and ask them so they can remember you. 
And that's great. And that's fulfilling, by the way. Yes? Uh, there's a story. Because uh, the St. Mary appeared to someone to them, if you don't come back, if you wait, uh, you don't go to the heaven, and uh, if you come back, you 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 take your relationship, and then he come back because he he. يعني بس لو أنت ما توقفش مش هتروح مش هتروح السماء مش هتروح السماء وبعدين بس لا لسه عايش لسه عايش على الأرض هي still alive لا الكلام بيقوله دكتور هاني ده للناس اللي ماتت لما هو بيقول له نص نظام بيقول له أنت ابعد حد ينبه اخواته ان هو يرجع ان هو سسيل اللي هو العذر فضل ابن ابراهيم ايوه ايوه هو بيقول له ابعد حد ينبهه ايوه بس على فكره ابراهيم سيد نو ايوه ماشي اه اه يو ار اجرين ويز ذا بوينت رايت ولا لا؟ اي ثينك اه اي ثينك هي سيين واي واي ديد سي ماري ابير تو ذات بيرسون اند سي اف يو دونت واي ديد هي جيت ا وارنينج اند ذا ريتش جايز براذرز ديد Saint Mary appeared to someone and told him, "If you don't pray, you're not going to heaven." Why weren't the brothers giving? I mean, there is always warning in the Bible. You don't need Saint Mary to appear to someone to warn him to go to heaven. It's very Bible. I thought I was lucky. Guys, uh, there is enough warnings in the Bible, as Marina said. I mean, you could say when he told them they have Moses and the prophets, they basically said more than Saint Mary. In the, in the Bible. We have enough. What is the verse in, uh, in Luke uh, 13 which says, unless you repent, you are all going to perish. I mean, if you want to, um, you can find many. Yeah. Any other questions or answers? So the, the main point of the prayer for the departed is to feel connected with the living church up in heaven. Yes. Uh, I, I don't... Clear, guys? Well, I will believe it. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Henry. I think it's very important.